Again, I want to say welcome uh, to Faith Lutheran Church. It's good to have each and every one of you here. Special welcome to those of you who might be tuning in online. If you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, I'm going to invite you to go to uh, the Gospel of John. John 20 is where we're going to be at today. John 20, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth gospel in the New Testament. Um, John was written by the disciple John, and uh, we're going to be uh, finishing up a sermon series today. If you're joining us for the very first time, uh, today we are actually concluding a sermon series called uh, Better Together. And the big idea behind this sermon series is that uh, as individuals, God has made each one of us unique, each one of us special, um, and God has created us uh, to be together, to serve together, to live together in community. And perhaps there's no better time uh, during this season of the coronavirus uh, where we are really feeling it, all of us are feeling it a little bit more, how much we need one another uh, and stay connected to one another. And of course, part of what it means to be better together is that we also help one another uh, become a better version of who God created us to be. And so this uh, sermon series, uh, over the past now nine weeks, each week, we are looking at a different aspect, a different personality, a different person in the life of the New Testament. God used some extraordinary, uh, uh, used some actually ordinary people to do some extraordinary things. And each week we're looking at a different person in Scripture and going, ah, you know, they were a pretty normal person. But somehow, some way, God used them uh, to impact uh, the kingdom of God. And, and here we are today, 2,000 years later, uh, because of some very ordinary people that God used in extraordinary ways. And so today, we're going to look at the disciple John, um, as recorded um, in the Gospel of John. Each week, we're also looking at uh, the uh, Enneagram uh, uh, personality assessment, looking at different personalities in the life of the church and, and frankly, in the life of the world. And today, we're going to finish up uh, looking at the Enneagram 9 type um, as, as we're finishing out our, our time together and looking at the, the personality also known as the peacemaker and along the way, we've been reading this book together. I hope you've gotten through this book this summer. It's a very fun, winsome, uh, I think in many ways light, uh, but also meaningful uh, book for us to travel together uh, through this summer. Everybody in John 20, everybody got your Bibles? John 20, you can do it online, digitally. Uh, I like uh, old school uh, uh, paper right in front of me. Uh, let us pray as we prepare to jump into John 20. God, we do thank you um, that you are a God who comes to us and meets us in all seasons of our lives. Lord, while we can't be together this morning, we are indeed grateful for the rain that comes upon the earth uh, that brings all things new. God, we pray that like uh, those things that are growing uh, through this rain, that you would make us new, refresh us, nourish us, restore us, make us, God, vibrant and alive. And Heavenly Father, as we prepare to read your word this morning, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, before the Apostle John uh, was the Apostle John, before he was the disciple John, before he was John, the author of five books in the New Testament, including the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of Revelation. John was just an ordinary guy. John was a fisherman. And he fished in the region, what we know of today as northern Israel, around a region called Galilee. And John was with his dad in their fishing business. His dad's name was Zebedee, and John also fished with his brother James. And they had this fishing business, and Scripture tells us uh, that John's uh, mother, uh, her name was Salome. And they were just this family, this kind of ordinary, devout Jewish family for sure. And so what was important for John for the first few decades of his life was fishing, 
family, and faith. That's who John was. They were a, a devout Jewish family. And that's really kind of their primary focus as John was growing up, kind of doing normal, everyday stuff. And then one day, along came this young rabbi, this guy by the name of Jesus. And he was from a village not far from where uh, John was growing up, also uh, very close to the Galilee region. Uh, in the region uh, Nazareth was the name of the town. And Jesus looked at John and his brother James and said, Hey, guys. Drop your nets. You guys got the whole fishing for fish thing down. Now I want to invite you to come with me and fish for people. Come on, John, James, Peter, Andrew. Let's go change the world. Let's go share with people about a brand new movement, a brand new way that people can experience the kingdom of God come to earth. And so that's what John and his brother James did, is they dropped their nets. And for the next three years, uh, James and John and Peter and Andrew, those four fishermen, and then pretty soon there were a group of 12 following this rabbi, uh, primarily around the Galilee region, but every now and then they would travel uh, south to Jerusalem. And uh, they, they did ministry together, they did life together, they did community together. And one of the things about John that we know and we see over and over is he wasn't just one of the 12. John was in the inner circle of the 12. He was very, very close to Jesus. John was there uh, when all the other disciples, except for just a few people, they weren't there when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter. Remember that time when Jesus went up to the, the Mount, what we know as the Mount of Transfiguration? John was there. John was in all these special places when everybody else was kind of doing their thing, going their different ways, including most of the disciples. John was there. But the interesting thing is as you study Scripture and you read about John's life over and over and over is John doesn't really say much. John is actually very, very quiet. We don't really hear much about John. When I think of John, I think of wallpaper on the wall right? It's, it's always there. Sometimes you notice it, sometimes you don't. But wallpaper, of course, doesn't talk. That's really John's life, is he's always there wherever Jesus is at. He's, he's watching, he's observing, he's interacting. But John's not out there like Peter. Remember Peter, the loudmouth, always the guy, the first one to speak, usually the loudest one to speak. Peter and John are opposite in many ways in personality. John is always there, much like Peter. Peter's talking. Peter's fully engaged in everything that's going on. John is also there, but he's very, very quiet, according to Scripture. Now, the interesting thing is, after these three years we move into Holy Week, the last week of John's life. And a really interesting thing happens with the, the disciple John. It's like he comes off the wall, and all of a sudden he becomes very present, he becomes very physical, and all of a sudden John starts talking a lot. And John was there that last week. You know, John was so close to Jesus. If you've ever seen uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper picture, the guy right next to Jesus with his head on Jesus' shoulder, that's John. That's how close they were. You know, right after they had that Last Supper, all the disciples went off to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus said, okay, guys, he's got, he's got his 12 guys there with him, uh, minus Judas, who has already left. And he says, I'm going to take just a few of you and go pray. And he says, John, I want you to come with me. So now it's just Jesus and a handful of guys praying off in the garden. Well, pretty soon, as you know the story, the soldiers show up to arrest Jesus. And everybody flees. Everybody scatters. Everyone runs away, including John. Everybody's terrified. But the next scene is Jesus 
on the cross. All the disciples have scattered except John. John is the only disciple standing there at the cross. And it's this really powerful moment. And pretty soon, Jesus and John have this conversation. Jesus looks at his mother, Mary, and says, Behold your son, looking at John. And then he looks, Jesus looks at John and says, Behold your mother. It's a very small detail, and I think it's a curious detail. And I wonder if it doesn't help us to understand the relationship between Jesus and John. That Jesus and John might have been closer than Jesus was with his own family, with his own brothers and sisters. That's the kind of relationship John had with Jesus. They were very close friends. John was there when Jesus took his last breath on this earth and bowed his head. They took Jesus' body off from the cross and put it into a stone tomb. And then our story picks up in John 20. Everybody grab your Bibles. Here we go where the story picks up. Three days later, John 20, beginning with verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now, I underlined in my Bible, the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. That's a very curious statement. Who is this other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved? Well, as we were, as I said at the top of the message this morning, John is the guy who wrote the Gospel of John. And what we know about John is over and over through the Gospel of John, he refers to himself as the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And for most of us who are not uh, Enneagram 9 types, we think to ourselves, that's kind of strange. Why doesn't John, like Peter or the Apostle Paul, just say, I was there. Peter and John went to the tomb uh, with Mary Magdalene to see the risen Christ. He doesn't do this. He uses this euphemism. And this is one of the the reasons why I think John uh, is an Enneagram 9, a peacemaker, Like the wall, remember the wallpaper? He's always just there, but he doesn't want to say much. He doesn't want to draw attention to himself. For John, this is completely normal. And this is how I think John views himself as he's there, but he just is not that important. And so he calls himself the, the, the disciple that Jesus loved. And I was thinking a little bit about this. I'm not a nine, so I don't really get this. I think this euphemism is a little bit strange, but it would like be like a little bit like me standing before you on a Sunday morning and giving a sermon illustration about myself and saying, you know, the pastor of Faith Lutheran Church, a priest and a rabbi go into a bar. Then the pastor of Faith Lutheran Church does this. Then the pastor of Faith Lutheran Church does that. Can, is that just weird for me or is that weird for any of the rest of you? Who talks and refers to themselves in the third person like this? I don't. Peter doesn't. Paul doesn't. But John does. Because this is how John views himself. He sees himself this way in the world. And again, this is why I think John is an Enneagram 9. I think he's a peacemaker. You know, the interesting thing about Enneagram 9s, if you've been following all along over the past week, they're sometimes called the crown of the Enneagram. Because if you've ever seen uh, the diagram of the Enneagram, they're right up at the top. 
And the Enneagram nines, they can identify with the one, the two, the three, the four, the five, the six, the seven, the eight, uh, but they can't identify with themselves because all of a sudden that would cast them into the spotlight. Do you hear how ironic this is? If you're an Enneagram 9, you relate to all the other Enneagram types except for your own. And you don't re relate uh, to your own uh, Enneagram type because you're so busy focusing on other people. And if you were to focus on your own nineness, all of a sudden it means that you're setting yourself apart from everybody else. And a nine would never do that because they're a peacemaker. See, all of a sudden, if you set yourself apart against other people, you're all of a sudden putting yourself out there and you're creating conflict. You're saying to the rest of the world, I'm not like everybody else. You've drawn a line in the sand. And for Enneagram nines, any little bit of causing conflict with the world makes you uncomfortable. You're a peacemaker. That's who God made you to be, and I think that's who God made John to be. You'd mu much rather just kind of melt in with everybody around you rather than coming to church on Sunday morning and introducing yourself as, as whatever your name is. You just want to say, hey, I'm part of the church. I'm just here with everybody else. And you, you, you put your identity in the crowd and you oftentimes will defer every single decision out there to everybody else because you want to just go with the flow with everyone else. For you Enneagram 9s, your motto might be, don't rock the boat. Let's just keep everything smooth, everything steady. If you're an Enneagram 9, a peacemaker, uh, you're, you're, you might be singing the Bobby McFerrin song from a few years ago. Don't worry, be happy, Right? And if you're in Africa, you'd be singing Hakuna Matata. I mean, that's just what you do. Everything is good. Everything is fine. Let's just go with the flow. Let's just not rock the boat. I think that's John in our story today. Verse 3. So Peter and the other disciple started running for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked into the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen." So again, a couple more times, John refers to himself as the other disciple. It wasn't Peter and John raced to the tomb, but it's Peter and the other disciple raced to the tomb. But curiously, interestingly, um, the other disciple arrived there first, which is really just a humble brag, right? This is John's way of saying, I was faster than Peter, I got there before Peter, but he doesn't say I did it. He says the other disciple got there. And, you know, we live in such an interesting day and time uh, with social media uh, that I think we've kind of gotten really used to this whole idea of humble bragging, right? We post all sorts of images out on social media um, to brag about ourselves, to brag about our kids, to brag about our grandkids, all the wonderful things uh, me and my family are doing, but we just put them out on social media um, because it's really more of a humble brag, right? It's not, I mean, but that's what we're doing. We're bragging about ourselves. Look what I've done, and here's a picture to show it, but I'm not really bragging, because I'm too humble for that. I'm just showing you a picture of what my amazing, unbelievable, genius grandson is doing in this world, right? It's a humble brag. And again, I, I think that's what John's doing. I think it's a big, humble brag. I got there first. But it was the other disciple who got there first. You know, the other thing I love uh, that's going on in the story here that John tells us about is his Enneagram 9-ness, his peacemaker-ness really comes out. Because when John gets to the tomb, he doesn't go in. Because he, know, he knows Peter's a hothead, right? 
And he knows that if uh, he gets there first and Peter's right on, his, uh, right on his tail and they start elbowing one another to get in first, I mean, the, the scripture could have been written that if John didn't do what John did, a fist fight could have broken out between John and Peter in terms of who's going to go in first. Or they're going to have this verbal sparring. I got here first, I'm going in. Oh yeah, but I'm Peter and I'm the rock and it goes back and forth, right? But John says, well, we're not doing that. No conflict here today, folks. And John steps aside and says, hey, Pete, after you, not going to rock the boat today. You go look first. And he allows Peter to go in and see that Jesus is not there. You know, this is one of the things I love about John the disciple, John the apostle, is he really gets what our purpose as Christ followers is to be all about, is to love and serve others. That's what you Enneagram nines do, you peacemakers do. You just love and serve others. John was there at the Last Supper, and he records the words of Jesus, now that I have loved you, I want you to go love others. I give you a new commandment. Now go and do it. John later would write in 1 John 4, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God and born of God. Those who do not know God don't know true love. John is the disciple of love, and he demonstrates it in so many ways as a peacemaker throughout his life. And then, of course, the most famous uh, verse in all of Scripture, John records Jesus saying these words, for God so loved the world that he gave us his son, Jesus Christ. Over and over John talks about and invites other people to love. He demonstrates for you and for me what it means to be loving people. You know, over the past couple weeks, we've talked about um, healthy and unhealthy in our Enneagram types. And those of you who are nines, when you are healthy in your nineness, in when you are a peacemaker, you are some of the most extraordinary, loving, optimistic, hopeful, peace, peaceful people in the world. You know, there are likely more presidents of the United States who are Enneagram nines, starting with Abraham Lincoln, Dwight Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, Gerald Ford, George W. Bush, and Ronald Reagan. Many people think all those presidents were Enneagram Nines. Why? Because they had this burning passion to bring people together. That was their goal. That's what they wanted to do. They saw conflict. They saw problems in the world. And they just said, can't we all get along? I'm going to become president of the United States and fix things. And so in there, when they're really healthy, they're able to really fix things, fix people, help people in the world. You know, some other uh, famous uh, Enneagram nine types peacemakers, Walt Disney, Right? I mean, that's what Walt Disney did. That was his goal was, hey, let's just make the happiest place on the earth, a place where everybody can be, um, have fun, where we can just kind of set aside all the troubles, all the problems, uh, everything in our lives. Let's just go have fun uh, and bring people together in a place called Disneyland and Disney World, right? And, and then all the movies and the ways in which Walt Disney has invited us to go to a new place, to a happy place, to a better place. Walt Disney was absolutely an Enneagram 9. 
It's a world of laughter, a world of fears. It's a world of hope and a world of tears. There's so much that we share that it's time to aware. It's a small world after all. Studio audience, sing with me. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. It's a small, small world. You're going to be singing that the rest of the afternoon. But it's going to make you feel good, right? That's what Walt Disney did. He helps us to feel better in the midst of all the conflict and the problems in the world. Another famous uh, Enneagram type, Jim Henson, the guy who created the Muppets, right? When I was a kid, I loved Fozzie Bear. How can you not love Fo Fozzie Bear, right? I mean, he just makes you feel so good. Everything inside feels so good. One more famous Enneagram, uh, type nine, George Lucas. He invited us to let our minds go to a galaxy far, far away and dream about peace, to dream about the world could be a better place, right? That's why the nine-part series ends with the rise of Skywalker. It's going to get better. It does get better. And I love the ways in which George Lucas has used his Enneagram 9 type to make us all feel a little bit better, to feel a little bit more hopeful. And, you know, like all the uh, other Enneagram 9 types, there's a really, really unhealthy side if you're an Enneagram 9, a peacemaker. Because a peacemaker, when unhealthy, can just straight up be a conflict avoider. Somebody who looks at the world and says, ooh, I'm not engaging, I'm stepping back. It's just too painful out there. And for you unhealthy Enneagram 9s, you might even find that uh, your, many of your relationships, um, uh, you just want to step back from them. And so you can become isolated and separated uh, from the rest of the world. If, when you're unhealthy, if you're a, a peacemaker, an Enneagram 9, you're the type of person that can just look down at your phone and scroll mindlessly through all sorts of stuff because everything out there is too painful, it's too awful, it's, it's too stressful. And so you just want to go to your happy place and you can just look at your phone and scroll for hours looking for your happy place. And if you're unhealthy as an Enneagram 9, if you don't have a phone, you can just sit in a chair and look off in the distance and daydream. You mentally disconnect. Because everything out there, and even in here, it's too painful. And so you mentally go to your happy place. And so there's lots of dangers, lots of warnings for being an Enneagram 9 and to move from uh, being unhealthy uh, toward being healthier. Well, let's get back to uh, our scripture reading uh, here this morning. Finally, the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciple back, went back to where they were staying. You know, Jesus, after he resurrected, he spent time with John and all the disciples, and he showed himself to many, many people. And the church continued to grow and grow and grow. And the interesting thing is, in the early church, uh, John was a prominent leader. But very quickly, and maybe just as quickly as he stepped out onto the stage during Holy Week, in many, many ways, John kind of went quiet again in the early years of the church. I mean, honestly, what could John say anyways? Because in the early uh, years of the church, Peter was out there with his loud mouth, yakking and talking about the gospel over and over. And whenever Peter was in a room, nobody else could get in a word edgewise. And then the apostle Paul came along, and Paul, like Peter, he was a talker. He thought out loud, and on and on and on. He was an expositor of, of the gospel and of scripture. 
And so there's John. He's still present. He's still there. He's still showing up at church council meetings, but we don't hear much from John. And then pretty soon, persecution in the life of the church begins. And one after another, many people are martyred for their Christian faith, including the disciples. In fact, John, the very first disciple to be martyred in the life of the church was John's brother James. First martyr, disciple in the life of the church. And John watched this tragedy unfold before him. He witnessed many of his friends, and he heard about Peter being martyred for the faith. Pretty soon, uh, John heard about the Apostle Paul uh, being martyred for his faith. And the list goes on and on. And John lived a long, long time. Many scholars believe he lived well into his 90s. John was an old man by the time he was uh, sent off to the island of Patmos where John later would write uh, the book of Revelation that we know of today. And I think it's very fitting that John lived to be an old man, an elder statesman. John is the only disciple uh, who was not martyred for his faith. And you have to ask the question, why? Why wasn't John killed like all the other disciples? I think it's because John was a peacemaker. He was a diplomat. He knew how to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ without getting everybody all rankled. And he he certainly did it through his writings of the gospel of John. He did it through 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. John knew how to communicate to the world that people didn't get all upset. Remember, he was a a peacemaker. He knew how to communicate what needed to be communicated, but not get everyone all upset. We don't know exactly know how and when John's life ended, but he most likely died of natural causes. What an extraordinary man John was. Not everybody was healthy, a healthy nine, a healthy peacemaker like John. And so this morning, I'm going to close, conclude like I have the last couple weeks by giving uh, you, especially you three, uh, you Enneagram nines, three suggestions for how you can move from being unhealthy uh, towards healthier, or even the healthiest of all. I don't know. So if you want to take notes, uh, this might not be a bad uh, time for you uh, to write in your margin, uh, moving from an unhealthy to a healthy uh, Enneagram nine. Number one. Here's what I want you to hear, nines. You matter. You matter. You're really, really important people. I know you don't feel like you matter because you so identify with everyone else and you can relate and empathize with all the other Enneagram types. And perhaps more than any other Enneagram type, you just think, well, just little old me. I'm not really gifted. I'm not really talented. I don't really have the right personality. I mean, I kind of get all the rest of you, but not me. And what I want you, Enneagram Nines, you peacemakers to hear is that you matter. You have a gift to bring to the world. I know you feel like wallpaper, that you're there, but nobody really notices you. And I want to invite you to, like like John, the disciple John, to step off the wall and out into the world. Have your Holy Week moment. In fact, Enneagram 9s, you peacemakers, perhaps now today, more than ever, we need you because the world is filled with all sorts of anger, bitterness, hatred, people going at each other's throats all day long. And and for you Enneagram Nines, you peacemakers, you hate this, right? You do not like COVID-19 because all you hear is the noise and the garbage and people not getting along and the dissension and the division. And you're just like, ah! And your your inclination is to just um, hole up and stand on the wall like the wallpaper and go, yeah, I'm just not, I'm not engaging. But more more than ever, you need to step off the wall and engage in the world because you matter, you have extraordinary gifts, and the world needs your gifts. Number two, 
Continue to love others as you do so naturally and how God made you. Remember, that's what John did is he just loved others. Beloved, let us love one another. Over and over, it's about love. And you nines, you peacemakers, you know how to love uh, better than the rest of us, perhaps. But here's what I want you to hear, uh, Enneagram nines, you peacemakers. Love as Jesus taught us to love not as the world tells us to love. See, the world comes to us and tells us to love without boundaries. The world comes to us and and says, here's what love is. Love is love is love. However you're feeling, um, I'm just going to love you and and, uh, put up with whatever uh, you've got going on in your life. And however I'm feeling today, I'm just going to call that love as well. That's the world's definition of love. It's just what everybody's feeling, however anybody's living their lives. We're not going to judge anyone. We're just going to love without boundaries. And you Enneagram Nines, which you need to hear more than anything, is that Jesus always put boundaries on love. Jesus says, this is what love is. This is what love is not. And so for you Enneagram Nines, you peacemakers, I want to invite you and challenge you to read through the Gospels, read through the New Testament, looking through the lens of love and saying, what is Jesus saying about love? Because all day long the world is going to talk to you about love, but that is not Jesus' definition of love. So embrace your your love, but also use it through the, the, the definition and the language and the instructions of Jesus. Number three, you are more than a number. You're more than a number. You're not just an Enneagram nine. You're just not a nine. You're not just a a five. You're not just a two. You're not just a three. You're not just a nine. You are a child of God. God has created you wonderfully and uniquely to serve in this world. And, you know, really many of the reasons why we're doing this Enneagram uh, over the summer is is for us to just kind of take a slice at, at possibilities for who God made us. You know, we're not pigeonholed as a nine or a seven or a three. We're children of God. God knows us and loves us. And we're having this conversation to really uh, begin the conversation. This is not a way of saying this is who you are. It's a way of beginning the conversation and say, hey, let's talk about who you are. Who did God make you to be? And I wonder if this might be some possibilities who God made you to be. When I got my uh, Enneagram assessment back, I'm not a nine, I'm a five. I made three copies and I got out a a red pen. And the first copy is I just went through uh, my Enneagram assessment and said, yep, I think that's me. Nope, that's not me at all. And I kind of went through with a a discerning eye for uh, these different pieces because uh, while there are many things that I relate to uh, being an Enneagram five, I'm not a five, I'm Brian, right? And there are little pieces that have helped me to understand a little bit more about who God made me but I'm not a five and none of you are purely any one number. And then what I did is I gave the second copy to my boss and I said, here you go, have at it. How much of this stuff do you see in me? How much of this stuff as a five do you think that's not me? And then we had conversations, multiple conversations about, yeah, I kind of see this. Oh, this is really you. Yeah, I don't see that at all in you. And then I gave the third copy to my wife. And I said, have at it. What do you see? And then we've had many conversations, and she wrote in the margins. She's like, oh, that is so you. That is is like the most unhealthy part of you. And I think this is you. And I, I just don't see that at all in you. And so for you nines, for all of us, we're more than a number. And my hope is as we conclude this sermon series this summer, we would all see one another as children of God, beloved and gifted and with the invitation for God to use our lives. And I hope you see this study as the beginning of a journey for us to grow and to become better versions of ourselves, just like the Apostle John. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this extraordinary servant of Jesus Christ, the man we know as the Apostle John. God, we're reminded um, that long before he was this extraordinary giant of a man in our minds, he was just an ordinary fisherman, just doing what he was doing with his dad, with his brother, his mom. And so God, help us to remember that that's what you do over and over in God's world, in the lives of your people. You take ordinary sinful, broken people. You use them, God. You mold them. You shape us through your son, Jesus Christ. You forgive us. You heal us. You renew us. And you send us to serve in your church and to serve in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.